the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you are unashamed of us, sinners though we are. You have given us your love. Enable us in our life to always be unashamed of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the reality shows like Big Brother, Survivor, The Amazing Race, variety shows were a hit, usually headlined by some well-known entertainer like Carol Burnett or Rowan and Martin or Flip Wilson. And I know some of you are going, who? Who is that? Well, let me just say they were like the Carson Daly and Ryan Seacrest of their day, except they hosted variety shows rather than reality shows. But one of the shows that you can still find clips on YouTube is of the Art Link Letter Show. I know this is going way back. But people loved it when he would take kids out of, the, out of the audience and set them up on stage and ask them questions. The sketch was called, The Ki- Kids Say the Darndest Things. And seldom did the kids disappoint. They were quite entertaining, often to the embarrassment of their parents, but still it was entertainingly humorous. In one such episode, though, he lines up some kids on stage and asks them some questions. Questions. And the questions are always kind of set up questions. Like he would say, Okay, now your parents always get along, right? And your dad and mom never tell the other one what to do, right? But, you know, sometimes mom has to tell dad not to do something. So, what was the last thing mom told dad not to do? And with a setup like that, I mean, who knows what the kids are going to say? And one kid did not disappoint. He said, well, mom told dad not to pass gas at the table, breakfast table, because that was bad manners. And the giggle of the audience and the look on Art Linkletter's face was enough to, to cause laughter throughout the whole audience there. It's probably good back then they didn't pan the audience and focus on the parents, because I'm sure the parents were kind of slung down in their seats at that time. But in another one, um, he had uh, kids up on stage, and he asked this girl, he he goes, he asked her, so what's your favorite Bible story? A question you probably wouldn't hear on TV today. And the young lady said, "Um, Jesus uh, making wine at the wedding. And I thought, 
wow, you know, why would she say something like that? And I said, I, I bet that was her Sunday school lesson from this past Sunday, and that was the only thing she could think of at the time. But he goes with it, and he says, so, how was Jesus able to do that? And she goes, by his power. And he goes, right, very good. And what did Jesus make the wine out of? And she said, water. He goes, right, very good. So, What's the lesson in this story? And the girl paused for a bit, and you could see she was thinking, and her answer was, the more wine at a wedding, the better. (laughs) Her parents must have been proud. (laughs) Our gospel lesson today that we just read doesn't have anything humorous in it, but it does have a misunderstanding that leads to some embarrassment. You see, Jesus' disciples had been following him for almost three years now, and so Jesus decided it was time to ask some questions, a a pop quiz of sort, to gauge their understanding of what's been going on. So Jesus asks a setup question. Who do people say that I am? Oh, you're, they say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But then he gets to the real question, who do you say I am? And Peter nails it. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Yet when Jesus, after, after saying that's right, you know, Jesus begins to explain what that means to be the Messiah, that he has to suffer and die on the cross. And that was just too much for Peter. I mean, crucifixion is the most shameful way to die in those days. Crucifixion was meant for those to show that they were completely inconsequential people. And so if their master would be shamefully executed on the cross like that, that means shame would be put upon the disciples, his followers as well. They would be subject to ridicule and derogatory slams as much as the media slams President Trump these days. So Peter takes Jesus aside and says, Jesus, this is not going to happen. Peter did not want to bear any shame. So Jesus again begins to teach them what true discipleship means. He says true discipleship means to take up your cross and follow me. Even if that means bearing shame in this sinful generation. And what was the cost of discipleship? Loss of life. If you want to save your life, you lose it for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel. And then Jesus concludes his teaching with these words. If anyone is ashamed of me in this sinful and adulterous generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes again. Following Jesus is not going to be easy. It may mean embarrassment or shame in this generation and culture, but it is the only way to be saved. It seems this generation's church, though, is too easily tempted to play it safe, to accept the dictates of of culture, to be armchair disciples. Some people have not woken up to the fact, or just now waking up to the fact, that the 21st century culture is not only not church-friendly, it's not even church-broken. We, um, the church as a witnessing body of Christ, is constantly being undermined by nearly, on nearly every social and political and um, cultural front. And instead of facing up to the fact of this extreme situation and extreme threat, we generally like to play it safe, a sort of 
go along to get along attitude. So we shut up about alternative lifestyles. We shut up about living together outside of marriage. We shut up about political corruption. We shut up about the murder of numerous innocent babies. And more and more Christians in, are in the public square find themselves um, facing doing a rear guard apologetic rather than a frontline proclamation. Notice I said a frontline proclamation, not a confrontation. You know, there are some groups who, <laughs> that's their tactic, is confrontation, shouting out, protesting in that. That's not what Christians are called to do. Christians are called to proclaim God's Word in a frontline way. But yet, we just seem to have this idea that we must somehow have to protect God. You know, protect Him from the attacks launched by post-Christendom culture. Whether it be a personality on TV who says that uh, Christian faith is a mental illness or doing some other rear guard apologetics. But if God is so wimpy that, he had, that His divine reputation rests upon a out-of-shape, overweight, soft-in-the-belly church, then we really are in trouble. Christians need to stop worrying about protecting God's good reputation and simply speak the truth of God's Word. God's power is in His Word, not in us. We don't have to level accusations. We don't have to be judgmental. We don't have to be confrontational. We simply speak the truth of God's Word. And when we do, what we find out is that we do have a God who is big enough to deal with whatever human sinfulness this world may dish out. We have a big enough God to reach through the internet. We have a big enough God who can break down cynicism. We have a big enough God who can push through the barriers of race and nation and culture. We have a big enough God who can wade through hatred and attacks and slurs. We have a big enough God who can fly through the vastness of the universe. We have a big enough God to enter through the expanding possibilities of medicine and science. A few years back, after a really big thunderstorm that was kind of typical of here in Kansas with exceptionally large hail, I was walking out of open arms here, and one of the parents who happened to be also a member of our congregation was kind of uh, asking about the damage done to the roof uh, here at Open Arms with that exceptionally large hail, you know, the, and she was um, kind of concerned about these hailstones from heaven. And, as affectionate criticism, she says, you know, God should have just been more careful. You know, people were going to talk. Look, God does not need our protection. He is big enough to handle the heat. When Jesus, when, um, Jesus was calling his disciples and calling us, he asks us and is calling us to be unashamed 
of him to move out of armchair discipleship and let God be God by simply speaking his words, letting its power do the work. Being willing to speak the truth of Jesus is being unashamed of him. When Peter, in our gospel lesson, confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, he finally took a leap of faith, a genuine risk. He quit being an armchair disciple and became an extreme disciple, risking everything for the thrill of claiming Jesus as Messiah totally and completely, losing his life completely to follow Jesus. But when Jesus followed Peter's big risk by announcing an even bigger God-sized risk that he was going to take, Peter lost his nerve. Peter had come to recognize Jesus as Messiah because of the golden days of his Galilean ministry. Peter couldn't fathom that his just-confessed Messiah was big enough to embrace the shame and defeat, the suffering and rebuke, the torture and death that Jesus predicted was going to happen on the cross. Peter thought he had to protect Jesus from this happening to him, had to protect his divine reputation from this shameful demise. So in spite of the confession that he gave, which is a very great confession, Peter's concept of the Messiah just wasn't big enough. Peter's worries of shame were ridiculous, though, because Jesus was God incarnate. Jesus was big enough to shoulder the cross, to bear the suffering. He was big enough to endure the scorn and rejection, big enough to accept the judgment of death. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, was big enough to endure all of this, to take, to take the ultimate risk of become, because he knew the new God firsthand. He was big enough because he was God himself. Big enough to overcome hate with love, big enough to wipe out suffering forever, big enough to roll the stone away from the grave, big enough to break the bonds of death, big enough to share the glory of the resurrection with all those who put their faith in him. You see, Jesus first lesson on discipleship was that there is nothing out there that can take away God's love from us. There is no scorn, no shame that could ever separate us from God's love. Jesus' biggest fear was that, was that we would, in, Jesus says that our biggest risk is playing it safe. Avoiding anything that may lead to shame or ridicule. Becoming what he called those who want to save their life by loving their life rather than losing their life in following him for the sake of the gospel. Here's the promise Jesus gives us. Jesus is unashamed of the cross. And Jesus is unashamed to call you and me his brother and sister. And as followers, 
We are unashamed of the cross. We are unashamed of God's word. We are unashamed of being called Christians. We have a big enough God. We have a big enough Savior to handle whatever ridicule may come our way as we speak the truth of God's word. St. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians. He says that the cross of Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those of us who are being saved, that includes you and me, to those of us who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Four. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand for prayer?